probably the most famous Punjabi to come out of Canada after Justin Trudeau. And thankfully, she doesn't do the bhangra and wear odd clothes. Older women want to adopt her. She reminds them of their younger selves. Younger millennial women want to be her. Men, I think, in secret, read her, or should, to understand women. She's poised, provocative, powerful. She writes about sexuality, abuse, love, loss, longing, racism, and revolution. In the age of Me Too, she stands strong. She speaks the unspeakable, writes the relatable, and shines a bright light on the dark nights of our soul. Originally from Hoshiarpur in Punjab, then from Montreal in Canada, she's a global girl. She's all of 25. Her first book of poems, Milk and Honey, sold over 2.5 million copies and became the number one New York Times bestseller. Her second book, Sun and Her Flowers, is already a runaway success. Ladies and gentlemen, Rupi Kaur. Good afternoon. How is everybody doing? We're good, okay, fantastic. It's amazing to be here. Thank you so much for a warm introduction. I am actually just wrapping up my India tour. We've been on the road all across the country for the past two months, taking my two books of poetry everywhere. So it's amazing to end it here. So I don't know if any of many of you have heard or are familiar with spoken word, but I'm going to be doing a bit of spoken word. We're going to begin the performance with some spoken word end and then read from the book in between that. So the first piece is called What Love Looks Like. What does love look like, the therapist asks, one week after the breakup? And I'm not sure how to answer her question except for the fact that I thought love looked so much like you. And that's when it hit me. That's when I realized how naive I had been to place an idea so beautiful onto the image of a person. As if anybody on this entire earth could encompass all love represented as if this emotion that seven billion people tremble for would look like a five foot 11, medium sized, brown skinned guy who likes eating frozen pizza for breakfast. So what does love look like, the therapist asks again, this time interrupting my thoughts mid-sentence, and at this point, I'm about to get up and walk right out the door, except I paid far too much money for this hour. So instead, I take a piercing look at her. The way you look at someone when you're about to hand it to them, lips, purse tightly preparing to launch into conversation, eyes digging deeply into theirs, searching for all the weak spots you most definitely know they have hidden somewhere, hair being tucked behind the ear as if you have to physically prepare for a conversation on the philosophies or rather disappointments of what love looks like. Well, I tell her, I don't think love is him anymore. If love was him, he would be here, wouldn't he? If he was the one for me, wouldn't he be the one sitting across from me? I don't think love is him anymore, I repeat. I think I just wanted something I believe was bigger than myself. And when someone showed up, that could probably play the part, I made it very much my intention to make him my counterpart. And I lost myself to him. He took and he took, wrapped me in the word special until I was so convinced he had 
eyes only to see me, hands only to be me, a body only to be with me. Oh, how he emptied me. Well, how does that make you feel? Interrupts the therapist. Well, I said, it kind of makes me feel like shit. Cause maybe we're all looking at it wrong. Maybe we think that it's something to search for out there. Something that's meant to crash into us on our way at an elevator or slip into our chair at a cafe somewhere. Appear at the end of an aisle at the bookstore looking the right amount of sexy and intellectual. But I think love starts here. Everything else is just desire and projection of all our wants, needs, and fantasies. But those externalities could never work out if we didn't turn inward and figure out how to love ourselves in order to love other people. Love does not look like a person. Love is our actions. Love is giving all we can, even if it's just a bigger slice of cake. It's understanding we have the power to hurt one another, but we're gonna do everything in our power to make sure we don't. It's understanding the kind sweetness that we deserve. And so when someone shows up saying they're gonna provide it as you do, but their actions seem to break you rather than build you, love is knowing who to choose. Thank you. So I wrote a poem on what, it, what the, the heartache you experience when you lose a friend because I felt like there just were not enough love songs and movies about what it's like to lose a friend. The underrated heartache. They did not tell me it would hurt like this. No one warned me about the heartbreak we experience with friends. Where are the albums, I thought. There were no songs sung for it. I could not find the ballads or read the books dedicated to writing the grief we fall into when friends leave. It's the type of heartache that does not hit you like a tsunami. It's the slow cancer, the kind that does not show up for months, has no visible signs, is an ache here, a headache there, but manageable. Cancer or tsunami, it all ends the same. Friend or lover, a loss is a loss is a loss. When you find her, tell her, not a day goes by when I do not think of her. That girl who thinks you're everything she asks for when you bounce her off the walls and she cries, tell her, I cry with her too. The sound of drywall crunching into itself as it's beaten with her head, also lives in my ears. Tell her to run to me. I've already unscrewed my front door off its frame inside. There's a warm bath running. She does not need your kind of love. I am proof she will get out and find her way back to herself because if I could survive you, well then, God damn it, so will she. Lessons from Mama. When it came to listening, my mother taught me silence. If you're drowning their voice with yours, how will you hear them, she asked. When it came to speaking, she said, do it with commitment. 
Every word you say is your own responsibility. When it came to being, she said, be tender and tough at once. You need to be vulnerable to live fully, but rough enough to survive it all. When it came to choosing, she asked me to be thankful for the choices I had that she never had the privilege of making. Advice I would have given my mother on her wedding day. One, you're allowed to say no. Two, years ago, his father beat the language of love out of your husband's back. He'll never know how to say it, but his actions prove that he loves you. Three, go with him. When he enters your body and goes to that place, sex is not dirty. Four, no matter how many times his family brings it up, do not have the abortion just because I'm a girl. Lock the relatives out and swallow the key. He will not hate you. Five, take your journals and your paintings across the ocean when you leave. These will remind you who you are when you get lost amid new cities. They'll also remind your children that you had an entire life before them. Six, when your husbands are off working at the factories, make friends with all the other lonely women in the apartment complex. This loneliness will cut a person in half, so you will need each other to stay alive. Your husband and children will take from your plate. We will emotionally and mentally starve you. All of it is wrong. Don't let us convince you that sacrificing yourself is how you must show love. Eight, when your mother dies, fly back for the funeral. Money, it comes and it goes, but a mother is once in a lifetime. Nine, you're allowed to spend a couple dollars on a coffee. I know there was a time when we couldn't afford it, but we're okay now, breathe. You can't speak English fluently or operate a computer or a cell phone, but we did that to you. It isn't your fault. You are not any less than the other mothers with their flashy phones and designer clothing. We confined you to the four walls of this home and worked you to the bone. You haven't even been your own property for decades. You are the person I look up to most. When I'm about to shatter, I think of your strength and harden. I think you are a magician. I want to fill the rest of your life with ease. You are the hero of heroes, the god of gods. Thank you. What if there isn't enough time to give her what she deserves? Do you think if I begged the sky hard enough, my mother's soul would return to me as my daughter so I can give her the comfort she gave me my whole life? I want to go back in time and sit beside her. Document her in a home movie so my eyes can spend the rest of their lives witnessing a miracle. The one whose life I never think of before mine. I want to know what she laughed about with friends in the village within houses of mud and brick surrounded by acres of mustard plant and sugar.
I want to sit with the teenage version of my mother, ask about her dreams, become her pleated braid, the black coal caressing her eyelids, flower neatly packed into her fingertips, a page of her school books, even to be a single thread of her cotton dress would be the greatest gift. When I go from this place, dress the porch with garlands as you would for a wedding, my dear. Pull the people from their homes and dance in the streets. When death arrives like a bride at the aisle, send me off in my brightest clothing. Serve ice cream with rose petals to our guests. There's no reason to cry, my dear. I have waited my whole life for such a beauty to take my breath away. When I go, let it be a celebration, for I have been here, I have lived, so I have won at this game called life. And my favorite piece in the book is called Timeless, and it's dedicated to all the wonderful women who are here today, to all the women who were here before me that allow me to be this person and perform, and to all the women who will come after me. They convinced me I only had a few good years left before I was replaced by a girl younger than me. As though men yield power with age, but women grow into irrelevance. They can keep their lies, for I have just gotten started. I feel as though I just left the womb. My 20s are the warm-up for what I'm really about to do. So wait till you see me in my 30s. Now that will be a proper introduction to the nasty, wild woman in me. How can I leave before the party started? Rehearsals begin at age 40. I ripen with age. I do not come with an expiration date. And now, for the main event, curtains up at 50, let's begin the show. You know what, I'm gonna read one more from Milk and Honey. I want to apologize to all the women I've called pretty before I've called them intelligent or brave. I'm sorry I made it sound as though something as simple as what you're born with is the most you have to be proud of. When your spirit has crushed mountains, from now on, I will say things like, you are resilient and you are extraordinary, not because I don't think you're pretty, but because I realize that you are so much more than that. Thank you. Okay. So, this next piece is called Broken English, and it was inspired by... I moved to Canada when I was about three and a half, and growing up in a very Indian home, but then also casually walking to your school with all the white kids, it was difficult because I had to do this fine dance between what the family wanted and what society in the West wanted. And growing up, it was always so embarrassing when we'd go to the grocery store and my mom would be yapping away so loudly in Punjabi to me and I'd be so embarrassed. I would literally shrink in my clothes and be like, mom, come on, can you just try to act a little bit more Canadian? And thankfully, I grew up and I think it was around like 21 when I was off at university, I realized, wow, I was so foolish. They dropped everything that they knew and understood for generations and generations, and they showed up at this foreign place, and they built this entire life for me and my siblings, and 
That, to me, is the definition of art, and that's how Broken English was born. I think about the way my father pulled the family out of poverty without knowing what a vowel was. And my mother raised four children without being able to construct a perfect sentence in English. A discombobulated couple that landed in the new world with hopes that left the bitter taste of rejection in their mouth. No family, no friends, just man and wife, two university degrees that meant nothing, one mother tongue that was broken now, one swollen belly with a baby inside, a father worrying about jobs and rent, cause no matter what, this baby was coming and they thought to themselves for a split second was it worth it to put all of our money into the dream of a country that's swallowing us whole and papa looks at his woman's eyes and sees loneliness living where the iris was wants to give her a home in a country that looks at her with the word visitor wrapped around their tongue. On their wedding day, she left an entire village to be his wife, and now she left an entire country to be a warrior. And when the winter came, they had nothing but the heat of their own bodies to keep the coldness out. So, like two brackets, they faced one another to hold the dearest parts of them, their children, close. They turned a suitcase full of clothes into a life and regular paychecks to make sure the children of immigrants wouldn't hate them for being the children of immigrants. They work too hard. You can tell by their hands, their eyes were begging for sleep, but our mouths were begging to be fed. And that is the most artistic thing I have ever seen. It is poetry to these ears that have never heard what passion sounds like. And my mouth is full of likes and ums when I look at their masterpiece. Because there are no words in the English language that can articulate that kind of beauty. I can't compact their existence into 26 letters and call it a description. I tried once, but the adjectives needed to describe them don't even exist. So instead, I ended up with pages and pages full of words followed with commas and more words and more commas only to realize that there are some things in the world so infinite that they could never use a full stop so how dare you mock your mother when she opens her mouth and broken english spills out don't be ashamed of the fact that she Split through countries to be here so you wouldn't have to cross a shoreline. Her accent is thick like honey. Hold it with your life. It's the only thing she has left from home. Don't you stomp on that richness. Instead, hang it up on the walls of museums next to Dali and Van Gogh. Her life is brilliant and tragic. Kiss the side of her tender cheek. She already knows what it sounds like to have an entire nation laugh when she speaks. She is more than our punctuation and language. We might be able to paint pictures and write stories, but she made an entire world for herself. So how is that? for art. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I think it takes a lot of courage to come out here and in front of all of you to say uh, 
what you feel and so beautifully. I think she deserves a much bigger round of applause. And I think I wanted to start with um, what you said about mothers. Uh, mm -hmm. As a mother myself, I often feel not quite, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I feel that my children don't quite um, respect me or love me as much as uh, they ought to. I think all mothers feel that. And it's so wonderful to hear your tribute to your mother. What does she mean to you? Everything that I basically, I mean, I've dedicated an entire chapter to her, and all of that comes from, I think Indian, nobody does sacrifice like Indian mothers. Like, yes. And that, it shatters me in so many painful ways, but also it opens up my heart with so much love. And I always look at my mom and I'm like, oh my goodness, I will never do and love and raise kids like you because you're just, it's something, something in the water was different there. Um, and I was inspired to write all of those because I was sitting alone, like off somewhere else, far away from my family. And what I couldn't let go of was the sacrifice, was the fact that, you know, she used to be a painter. She went out with her friends when they lived here. She did so many things for herself. And all of that had to stop so that I could be here on the stage today. Thank you. I think, yeah, that really deserves some applause. But, um, uh, you know, what is the response that other mothers give you? I've seen videos of uh, um, older women coming up to you and just sort of hugging you and, you know, then tears flow. How is that experience that you've been embraced by mothers as well, not just their I think daughters? The best, like, I mean... The best is when mom, moms come to the show, because that's it. I'm like, okay, fine. I think I've done something right, <laughs> you know? Because um, they've seen so much of the world and of love and of loss and of grief. So it fills my heart with so much joy when moms come. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you a question about the Me Too movement. It's so much about uh, abuse and, um, you know, all that women have gone through. And there's finally an outpouring of anger and rage. Uh, and you um, uh, echo so much of that, or rather that echoes so much of what you feel as well. How mm. difficult is it to really write from the heart, from deep inside your soul? So I always say it wasn't difficult. And I don't know if that's the right answer or the wrong answer. And the reason I say that is because when I started to write, I started performing nine years ago, and strictly, literally, the only content I performed was about sexual abuse and the violence inflicted on women's bodies, because that's what I was seeing around the Indian diaspora community around me living in Brampton. And so it was almost like bursting out of me, and that's why it wasn't difficult. What was difficult was going up on stage, performing it, and then people coming up to me afterward, and this is when I was a lot more impressionable and I cared a lot more about what people thought, um, but they were like, oh, th that makes me really uncomfortable. She's so aggressive, and I questioned, why am I talking about this? You know, I don't want to make people uncomfortable. I want them to like me, but then I realized that somebody has to write poems about this, you know? I would love to write love poetry, and it's great, but who's going to document the struggles that women are facing and the violence that's inflicted onto them. Um, uh, while you've got a lot of praise, a lot of people are quite mean to you as well, especially on Twitter. They don't really like you on Twitter. What's the meanest thing that they've said? And, you know, how do you react to that? So the fabulous thing about Twitter is that there's a logout function that I've effectively <laughs> used very well. So I actually don't know what the meanest thing is. So you just use that? Um, I just use... I use Instagram. I have my Twitter account up and running, but I'm no longer really using it. How has your Sikh identity shaped you? And Very you much. Uh, I grew up, you know, reading a lot of Sikh poetry, playing Kirtan for about eight years. That was really my first ever performance gig. Um, and it was something that we, I think a lot of it echoes in the love poetry and a lot of it echoes in chapter five. Uh, 
because we grew up talking about verses and all of those things, the idea that we should always push for a more freer and kinder and safer society for all, all of that really went into the poetry and comes from my sick upbringing. Uh, you once posted a picture of um, yourself menstruating on Instagram and it sort of, was it on Facebook, sorry, and it got a huge backlash, but it also established who you were. You were unafraid, fearless, willing to put yourself out there. When you look back at uh, that you so many years ago, what do you feel now? I, I feel good. I mean, that was, so I did a project for school. It was my last year of university, and we were supposed to create images that battled some sort of taboo, and it was actually a part of the project to put them online. And so everything that happened after that, I was so shocked by it. And that's probably my own naivety. Um, but I look back and I'm like, that's really cool. I hope I can continue to have that type of courage again. Uh, there's this, been this outpouring of teenage angst of late. We've had Lady Bird, this wonderful film that chronicles a young woman's journey to college. There's been 13 Reasons Why that looks at, uh, you know, how... Uh, a young woman is so depressed, depressed enough to kill herself. Uh, how is that part of what you're saying? I mean, that's, that's really one of the reasons why your poetry is so popular as well, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, sorry, it, could you? It, it, it echoes, it echoes mm. this whole uh, sort of teenage angst moment that we're in, right? Yeah. I mean, I think what I'm seeing in the younger generations is this need to go back to their roots and their desire to heal and their desire for self-care and their desire to focus on the self and shed the trauma of past generations. And to be more visible. Yes. And to be heard and to be seen. Exactly. And so often, you know, young people are just like brushed off as being spoiled, silly, not intelligent enough. And so I think I was, when I'm writing these books, I'm also... You know, I was 18, 19, 20, so it's like they're kind of growing up with me. And I think because I'm writing so raw and honestly about how I feel, it is naturally, it resonates. Because I read a couple of years ago somewhere that the thing that you fear the most is the thing that's most universal. So that's kind of my, the quote that I hear in my head every time I go to write. So I'm like, okay, write it, just write it, don't be scared. No one's going to come hate you on Twitter and, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> and my last question. Yeah. Uh, where does this fear and loathing of yourself come from? You're so beautiful. You're so accomplished. And yet, uh, you know, there's this fear and loathing that you sort of grew up with. And still you see traces of some of that in your poetry. Mm. Why? Um, I ask myself that question every day. I think we don't see ourselves how the world sees us. Like, I don't see myself how you see me. I see myself through my lens. And that lens has probably been tainted with the words and the things that people have said and done over the years. And I think that's really hard to unlearn. And a lot of women, because I, you know, there's so many of my friends who are like supermodels and like six feet tall and so gorgeous and they'll complain all the time that they don't feel beautiful enough and all those things. And I look at them I'm like, she's got to be lying, right? <laughs> um, that's ridiculous. But they genuinely, they can't see that. And I think that's why, like, it's true. Beauty is so much deeper than what's on the outside. If you don't feel it on here, you'll never see it out here. Brown is beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Rupi. It was fantastic. <laughs>